So I'm going to start off with an intro to, to our platform, uh, which is the Shindig platform. So let me just come back to the first slide in my presentation. And, and I'll go a little bit into, the, into EdChat Interactive first. Uh, EdChat Interactive was Steve Anderson, Tom Whitby, and myself, because as we were looking at the education landscape, we, we saw that there's a lot of great things going on in education, uh, but no really good way to share them. Uh, the um, Twitter is great. You can, you can create a, a, a personal learning network. Um, webinars are OK, but the fact of the matter is that we don't learn just by watching a talking head. So, uh, so we came up with a way for people to talk a little bit and, um, and then to, to do some small group work and to make the online presentation a lot more interactive. And that's, that's how we for, we chat interactive and we're using the Shindig platform to do that. What I'd like you to do is to look on your screen, find another person's icon, click on it, and ask each other two questions. Find out where the other person is from, and where and what gave them and what got them into education. Uh, you have three minutes to do that, and um, then uh, then I'll come back in about two minutes, and uh, and we'll go on and, and start the presentation. Hopefully, you've had a chance to uh, to chat with people. I see that that quite a number of you have clicked on other people's icons. And I'd like to introduce Erin Klein, a teacher, a social networker. You can see her on all this, the, the social networks, a nationally known speaker. And she's going to be talking tonight about parental involvement. I'll also give a little bit of a plug because our next session will be coming up on May 14th. That's going to be Shannon Miller. And she's going to be talking about how to use EdTech when, in teaching children's literature. And you can register at www.edchatinteractive. So I'm going to um, stop my broadcast. I'm going to bring up Aaron, and um, and and here we go. Thank you. Well, it's so good to see some familiar faces. I'm excited to talk to you guys about one of the topics that is that I'm most passionate about. Um, Mitch, I've got a quick question for you before I you doing that. Come back up. You know, Steve Anderson is the other administrator. I'm going to actually work on your other slides, and I hope Steve advances the slides. If he doesn't, just just like wave and talk, okay. and then I'll start advancing the slides again. All right, Bye. perfect. All right, Stephen. Just so that you know, um, there's a lot of slides, hence the uh, delay in getting started on for very long so you can just advance fast and I talk quick so go right ahead so I'm excited to talk to you guys about um, one of the topics I said that is most passionate of mine and that's really just communicating not only with students but then also with parents so I blog for Scholastic and a variety of other platforms and I think communicating is very important across the board so keep going Stephen um, we'll Divided up into kind of three sections. First of all, communicating in the way that you teach to the kids, and then communicating in the way that you teach within your classroom in the physical space, and then communicating in the way that you connect with parents and then with students as well. So really three. So first of all, thinking about what does designing your curriculum and communicating look like for the future for our students? And it's about the way that you teach. So we're not controlling my own slides. Um, I've written a variety of articles um, really to do with a lot with design and the physical space of the classroom because when I went into teaching, one of the first things that I noticed teaching first grade was having kids in desks um, being six and seven years old was really hindering my ability to deliver instruction. And no matter when I went to the middle school and taught grade six and seven and then back into the elementary, something across the board that I was the actual physical space of the classroom really affected how I was able to communicate with my students, but even more importantly, how my students were able to connect with one another. So you can find a variety of articles just by Googling like Ditch the Desk or even my name and classroom design. 
mine. Stephen, you can keep going. Um, one of them was on MindShift. Another one was on Smart Blogs for Education. Um, but really, they're just about how I set up my classroom design and just getting rid of the desk. And I have a very minimalistic approach. I've even got step-by-step -step pictures on Scholastic that you can kind of look through to see my process in doing so. And throughout this presentation, I'll share a little bit of that with you. The uh, physical space of the classroom environment, one of the first things that I did was really get rid of everything. Um, Stephen, I'll just, I guess, tap my chin like every time <laughs> to advance because they go really fast. Um, I've done a lot of studies on interior design. In fact, I studied interior design prior to going into teaching. And one of my favorite resources to look through is by Susan Kavalik, and it's all about brain-friendly classroom design. Really thinking about the classroom colors that are used, making sure everything is monochromatic. And I remember when I went into teaching, a lot of people said, oh, don't you want bright colors, bold, a lot of things on the wall, a lot of environmental print. But the more that you study by Carnegie Mellon that supports um, the attention to allocation for envi environmental print, truly that less is more. And you especially don't want to overstimulate classroom environments as we're increasing class sizes, students with special needs. Um, you you really want to make sure that everything is minimalistic in nature, just so that whenever you are communicating with your students of the important content, that that message is clearly seen. In addition to really just bringing in nature, making your environment more like a Starbucks, Barnes and Noble, a real comfortable laid back environment. Um, even thinking where you put things on display and bringing things to eye level and making sure truly that you declutter the environment. This is my classroom whenever I first did it, uh, really, really taking everything out of the shelves, everything just reorganizing. It does take time to do this. But it was it. Um, and, and really just making sure all the materials are at the kids' eye level. Um, I took everything that I wasn't using within the past six months out of the classroom, and I either put it up for grabs, donated it, recycled it, but really I just got rid of it because the environment wasn't about me. It was truly about the students. So you can see I've got a variety of just different seating arrangements in the classroom. Um, online, very affordable. It was less than $300. But really just thinking creatively about the space that you have so that when students do come together to learn and collaborate with one another, they can do so. And we have a lot of parent involvement in our school too. So even when parents come into the classroom, um, making sure that they have comfortable spaces to gather with student groups and small individual group settings. So whenever you do have a more laid back, comfortable environment, it does lead for a lot of collaboration within the classroom. And you can see here's my classroom with no desks. This was last year. It's changed a little bit this year, mainly just in the color schemes. But a lot of room, a lot of floor space. It's a lot easier to move one desk on a table than moving 10 or 12 desks. So it's a lot easier. So one of the things that kind of started me on this journey was thinking about would I truly want to be a student in my own classroom. So that's a question that kind of drives my practice. Having two children of my own, Jacob is seven and Riley is ten, I really think what would I want for them? And when I started thinking this is my schedule, we're on an A through F instead of a Monday through Friday. And I started thinking about the instruction that I was doing in my classroom. And one of the first things that I noticed was I was standing in front just doing lesson eight of unit six in everyday math and just kind of like pouring content into these children. And I knew that I needed a very popular, a lot of people were doing it and finding great success with it. So instead of having students sit there and listen to my lecture in class and then go home and do the homework, it kind of flips the model. So in essence, they would watch a video of my instruction at home and then come to class ready to either discuss or do the hands-on piece. Being that I was in a second grade classroom, I knew for my population that I could not do that at the time. So I decided to internally flip my classroom. So what that meant was I just put a spin on it. And I would have the students kind of rotate. And you can kind of keep going, Stephen. Rotate through a variety of centers. And you'll see I put, um, I've got a rotating schedule where they would come to me and then centers. And I used the tool EduCreations to kind of help me do that, knowing that it wasn't about what device, a Chromebook, an iPad, or any of that. It was truly just about um, the what I was doing with the technology, because it has to start with pedagogy first. That has to be the solid foundation. So what I found with um, 
the uh, iPad being able to rotate was that I was able to personalize instruction more for students because they were able to come to me within one group and I only had one iPad starting out and a lot of people ask me, Erin, how do you do it with just having minimal technology in the classroom? And I think it's really just about restructuring your classroom day. But one of the first things I do whenever I work with teachers in their classrooms is I say, how is your day laid out or how is your hour, or, how is your block for laid out and I think by deconstructing that time block and really evaluating how you're using that time putting the curriculum aside putting the technology aside putting the number of students you have aside and really just looking at the time frame in which you have and how you're best utilizing that time and then figuring out what resources you have at your disposal whether it's an iPad or some sort of technology and how can you utilize that to really enhance your curriculum to personalize instruction for kids so that's kind of where I started with it kind of a little backwards approach so you can see here my rotation schedule where I have children that kind of rotate um, on a Monday through Friday system. The T is for teacher on full screen you'll be able to truly see it and this is where they come to me for small group and I call it just my my small group literacy time sometimes we do reading sometimes we do writing in fact sometimes we even do math really just depending on the group that comes to me when the children are not with me you can see on the next slide how they'll rotate just through a variety of different stations and I ask the kids you know what if you had more time during the day what would you want and when I decided to flip my classroom I eliminated teaching spelling and I eliminated teaching handwriting so I looked at my schedule and said, okay, if I could take anything off and teach it in a different way, I knew the district I couldn't stop teaching spelling or stop teaching handwriting, but I could teach it in a different way. I had, because let's be honest, me in the classroom teaching a workbook on spelling is not that engaging. So I might as well do it on the iPad and try and add more visuals and audio and annotations and make it a little bit more engaging. Kids. So when I did that, they would rotate through and view my instruction on the iPad, and then they would have other stations or centers that they would go to as well. And I called these digital workstations. Um, there was a technology component in each. So then the kids would come to me, and this is Olivia just working on um, one of the websites. Uh, this is a group of mine working with the LiveScribe pen, another technology that we use a lot in the classroom, and then also doing a puzzle on landforms. But you can see th just throughout these, whether they're working with the technology, the children really are in independent but most importantly they're communicating with each other so I really wanted the focus of this session today with you guys to talk about communication and how to enhance it within the actual in classroom and then also with parents so these are the stations when I asked my kids guys now that we have this magical like 40 minutes or an hour left in our day what do you guys want more time doing and in my classroom predominantly Favorite time of your day, kids? Recess. And I, I wanted to change that. I wanted to think, you know, if I was a kid in my own classroom, would I enjoy it? And what would my favorite part of the day be? So when I asked my kids, we're going to do these digital workstations, but I want you to help me. And then let's figure this out together because it's not my classroom, guys. It's ours. And this was really empowering for seven year olds and really for any age group. And so when I asked my kids, I was floored when they said, Mrs. Klein, we just want more time to read. Okay, I can give you guys that. That's amazing. So I went through the list and um, they wanted a listening station. Um, I knew I had to do spelling and handwriting. So those were two stations that the kids were definitely going to rotate because those were what I flipped in my classroom and I was teaching uh, via the iPad. I did get one more iPad. So I started with one, but then I did get two. So you can see all the different stations here. And on the right hand side, I gather on the smart board. And I would put under my document camera just, you know, a template like this and all of the templates that I showcase in this presentation today are downloadable for free for you uh, via the web if you just Google the easiest place to find it um, is just Google Scholastic um, or actually really just Google my name Aaron Klein and digital workstations and you'll find it there's a Scholastic post it's like 3,000 words long and it's got a tremendous amount of free downloads with all the templates including this one that you see here so I ask the kids every Friday before we leave school as we gather on the carpet guys if you could do anything for next week like you know all the content that we've been so let's kind of think about and synthesize our learning for the week and they're so used to this now it's just second nature but um, what activities do you 
we want to put in our stations for next week and what devices can really help us accomplish those goals. And whenever I sat down with the kids on every Friday before we leave, and now that they're used to this, they're really thinking about it before Friday whenever they sit down with me. They're thinking about it throughout the week. What can they do for that following week for stations? So it helps me in planning and it helps us communicate and build that classroom culture and community. And it really gives them that sense of autonomy and ownership over their own learning, which is really, really great. So we kind of decide what in those stations. You can see a lot of these are, are we flipping through or? They're um, just items that I had in the classroom. Flip cameras I didn't use a lot anymore just because we had iPads. So it was really great just having a couple of these extra on hand we would put in our partner reading station. And Stephen, I'm just buying time if you want to advance. But the flip cameras, what we would do is um, put them in our silent reading station for partner reading. And then the kids, it really, really worked well because they were able to um, Slides. Right. I think I can start loading. But I don't have slides, the slides from 39 to 51. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I can finish talking about what they did in a few of the stations and we can do group work. We can flexible. So what I would do is whenever I put those flip cameras in the partner read station, it was really great because it's a management piece, which I really didn't intend for it to, but because they were being recorded, um, they were really always on task, and it was great because they thought every time they went to recess that I was really listening to all of their little stations in those hours and hours of of tape, but it was it was really cute. And and they did. They really they played back their reading so that they could hear their fluency and their rate. They were really listening about those thick questions and really thinking more about asking more meaningful um, like predicting type inferring questions rather than just those surface level or thin questions. Um, and then for the listening workstation, one of the things that we did, I inherited a bunch of cassettes they're really wonderful, um, like a lot of Patricia Polacco, Jonathan London, a lot of really, really great picture books. Um, and then they could hear those really incredible narrators um, telling those stories. So the kids loved that. Um, their favorite part was being able to learn how to use the cassette player. But that's actually one of their favorite pieces of technology. But I want to talk to you guys for just a minute because, I, like I said in the beginning, this is going to go pretty fast. We're already a half hour in. But the presentation today is really divided into three components. Um, the first is really thinking about how you communicate um, the physical landscape in the space of the classroom, um, how you communicate with your students in your instructional delivery, and then the third piece that we'll get into in just a minute, which is kind of where I want to spend the bulk of our time, so we'll get there in just a moment, um, is going to be how you communicate beyond the walls of your classroom and with parents. But before we jump there, I just want to pause for a minute and do a little bit of group work and thinking about um, how your current instructional practices are in your classroom. Would you want to be a student in your own classroom? And how are you personalizing instruction? So really just collecting on, on your own practice, but then thinking about to share out to the group how you're personalizing instruction within your classroom. So really, that's the one I want to discuss. Yeah. So have that one like in the front of your mind. You personal as well. They were just kind of um, questions, just to kind of reflect as you were thinking. Um, you know, would you want to be a student in your classroom? And just really thinking about how you're personalizing instruction. Okay, so it take you know, five minutes for people to click on other other icons of, of, of to come up and talk about how um, in the entire group how you're personalizing instructions and, and what you learn from the other person. Of what I consider the fun part is really getting to communicate with the parents because I think that there are some really 
unique platform out there that really enable teachers and students to be able to connect with the home in a really creative way. So one of the first ways that I want to share with you is called Biblionasium. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's Biblio for book and then Nasium for like gymnasium. So it's really an interactive platform, kind of like Facebook um, in the way that it operates. But students can recommend books to another and then also as students add more books to their bookshelves it really starts to kind of suggest and generate books based on the genres that they're liking the authors of the series so my kids never have to say I don't know what to get at the library because Biblionasium really starts to suggest certain titles to them and they get really excited they also love when their friends can make recommendations to them and I, as their teacher, too, if I just see that they're reading a lot of mysteries, I can start suggesting different books to them as well. And I like, too, that you can print off letters that Biblionasium already has in the site. You just have to print them off in a PDF form. But you can send home so that parents can also have a login. And they can see on the back end exactly what their children are reading and the types of books and any recommendations that they're receiving. And you can set up awards for them, too, if that's something that you're interested in. I don't do that in the classroom. But parents can even do that um, for incentives if they want to. Um, for X amount of books read, you can get a certificate or maybe stay up 10 minutes late or something like that. So we can go to the next one. This is kind of what it looks like from the student side, from a bookshelf. And you can see they've got just a variety of different options. Now, one of the clear things that I have to mention to parents is that you cannot or read the books from the site, because that is a um, misconception that a lot of parents have. But the students love it, because whenever they browse for books, they can read just brief synopsis of different stories to see if that's something that they're interested in or not. So it's a really, really handy resource that allows um, kids to communicate with each other um, when they're at home about books. And it's really just created a rich literature conversation in our classroom, but then also at home whenever they're not in the classroom. Another tool that I use, and this one is my absolute number one favorite, and this is called Remind, formerly called Remind 101. And this tool rates do apply, but you can do it via email as well. So parents can sign up either through texting or through email, and as a teacher, you can send out alerts to either parents or students. Because I'm in the elementary classroom, I send my reminders out to my parents. So if we go to the next slide, we'll be able to see some examples of the types of reminders that I send out. And I love this platform because you can do it in real time. So for example, if I'm on a field trip, and want to snap a picture of a group of children looking at something at a museum, I can do that and then instantly text it to every one of my parents who have subscribed to my Class Remind channel. And I have all of my parents at school during open house pull out their phones and we all subscribe together so I can make sure that we're all on the same page and I can help anyone get signed up that might have any questions. So on that field trip, if they're looking at something at a museum, I can snap a quick picture and then instantly in real time push it out to all of my parents and attach, of course, a, a caption explaining kind of what's going on at the field trip. Um, what I do is on Fridays before I leave school, I just sit down at my school computer and I pull out the planner and the school calendar and kind of look at the events going on next week, whether it's Spirit Day or an alternate dismissal or a play or anything, and I schedule all of the reminders wonderful because I can just schedule out certain reminders for if we're going on um, some sort of 7.30 in the morning when I would anticipate a parent be pulling out of the driveway so I can catch them and oh gosh I gotta remember to grab that out of the fridge or if it's spirit day the next day I'll usually send that text message out around 6 p.m. in the evening so that they have just enough time to do laundry or you know lay the clothes out for the next day so I try to be strategic about that as well um, a lot of coaches use this um, in a lot of different creative ways to notify teams of uh, uh, practice schedules practice arrangements. A lot of um, teachers use it too in the upper school for students that do have their own cell phones to send out even attachments of documents that students might need for studying. There's really just a variety of creative ways that you can use it. And you can set up multiple classes as well, so you're not limited in that regard. And you can see everyone who's signed up. And these are just examples. Um, one of my favorite things to do, too, is just to take a variety of pictures, either when the kids are at recess or um, in the classroom working on a certain project. I'll snap maybe 15, 20 pictures of just the kids in a variety of different settings or even throughout the entire day and I will be a photo A N I 
M-O-T-O, animoto.com. Um, it's also web and Android based. It's free, especially if you do the educator's account, which I highly recommend doing with your school email. Then you can get extended um, long versions of the movies that you can make instead of being limited to 30 seconds. So with Animoto, what I will do is it's really, really quick and easy to do. I'm a very low <laughs> learning curve kind of person. I need for things to be quick and easy for my second grade classroom. So with Animoto, I can quickly upload all of those 15, 20 pictures that I've snapped of the children and then just pick a theme that I want for the entire video and then quickly just pick music to it and they have all of the themes and the music archived within that Animoto platform so I'm not having to pull anything from a third-party resource and then it quickly renders the video and then instantly it's ready for you and it gives you the URL or the link and I can copy and paste that and then put it into a remind message and push it out in real time or schedule it and then instantly on the parent's cell phone they'll get a text message and I would have written something like be sure to watch this cute video of us at recess today and then the parents can click on the link and then instantly this really high quality professional looking video that took me all of about two and a half minutes and, and you know it's amazing and they're ooing and aahing and it's just great it's a great way to have parents inside the classroom when they're not Another tool that I like to use for digital portfolios is called Three Ring. This is also another free resource. And what we have to do at our schools, we keep all of our paper copies on file. But of course, you want to send the test copies and the assessments home with the children so that the parents can see them as well. However, it's hard to do that unless you make copies of them. So in order to A, save trees, and B, save space and clutter in my room, um, I choose to not go down to the photocopier and photo every single assessment for every single child for for every single unit of study and snap pictures of them or scan them in to a digital portfolio like three ring and then I can tag it with the um, content area so for example I might tag it Maggie math and that's really all I um, tag it as I'm, I could do it as like unit 8 if I want to, but I can just keep it simple for myself and I'll show you in a minute um, at parent teacher conferences kind of how I set this up and it's really really phenomenal because when I have parents come in I have myself sitting at a table with my computer set up here and then displayed on the computer I can have the child's entire digital portfolio pulled up and the parents can view it in real time on the screen right there papers back and forth and the shuffle everything is electronic right right there and it's really a high quality visual for the parents as well because they're not looking down they're actually still looking at you so it's really that eye communication and viewing things on a screen which is so much nicer you can see to manage students in three ring is really easy and then also what I love is every time my students take an assessment let's just say on Friday we take a spelling test I can quickly snap a picture of it in my app on three ring and then boom it goes because it's all cloud based so it goes to three ring on the web and then um, with just one click of a button I can push it out and they can view that child's assessment um, as soon as I send it to them. So it's really, really nice um, because before the child even gets off the bus at dismissal, the parents already seen and viewed the assessment because a lot of times things get lost in the backpack or they never make it home. So it's just a really great way. Also, if parents are divorced um, and you can't send both assessments home to mom and dad. Um, it's a really great way to have mom and dad both sign up for a service like Three Ring so that they can both have access to their child's content. <laughs> So this is how I mentioned at parent-teacher conferences, how I set things up. You can see at the breakfast nook in the back of the room, I have the parents can touch and scroll as well. I love the touch interface on that. And um, I have everything just right there for them. Of course, I always have little bottles of water and individual notepads set up. But to the right, you'll see I have all the student portfolio stuff for writing workshop because that is a little bit more difficult to scan into that electronic portfolio. But, um, and then any math journals that we have and the parents might want to see as well. So I have everything ready for conferences right there. I also have the students, um, we communicate to them just with letters home as well. So we made a class stationary. And on the first day of school, what I had kids do is just make, um, I cut out little squares of index cards and I just like a one inch by one inch or have, um, they just sketch a picture of themselves and then turn them into me. And when they went to art class, I or special or music or whatever I quickly um, just double side sticky taped all of those little pieces of the index card um, onto the perimeter of an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper and then when the kids came back in from their special I just had them sign their name under their little um, 
picture that they did, and then that became our class stationery. So we write letters home to parents a lot. It's just another kind of more traditional way that we communicate. Um, class Dojo is another resource that I use to communicate with parents. This one um, has been, there's been some controversy about it, just because people will say, well, I'm embarrassing my children by having uh, points up on a smart board and, you know, giving them points and deducting points. and. I I always like to make it very clear that that is not how this product is in second grade classroom. So if we go to the next slide, we use it as a whole group class system. So in the beginning of the year, I'm a workshop model teacher. Everything I do is very hands-on, personalized for the students. I teach kids where they are and then bring them where they need to go. For example, I teach the writer. I don't teach the writer reader, I don't teach your reading curriculum. So whenever we meet in the beginning of the year as small groups um, or whole groups, we decide what are the behaviors that we need for a workshop. What should it look like whenever we're reading independently or whenever we're writing independently? What should it sound like? What should we see? Um, and the kids really come up with all of these expectations. Um, it should be very quiet. You should build stamina and be reading in your story. There shouldn't be a lot of walking around. So we really think about explicitly what our environment should look like during certain areas of the day. And we chart them out on anchor paper. And then what I've done is after I have that anchor paper, anchor chart paper with all of these students and I have come up with together, then we put those into Class Dojo. And um, the kids during the first week of school, they get a big, um, they get a real sense of ownership out of kind of thinking about whenever we come back for that share time at the end of workshop for our lesson, we reflect as a group and we say, okay, what, you can go to the next slide, what went really well, um, what could we have done better, what's going to be a goal for next time. So we also use it as goal setting for ourselves as a class as well because really the kids need to know what they're doing well so that they can continue doing it and then always have a goal of something to improve upon. Next slide. And then we go, we talk about it not um, in terms of like positive and negative in the sense of how we can grow as a class community and then kids love seeing the graphs on the board um, they can relate to it a lot easier um, we can go to the next one too so and you can see this is actually all done through the students I don't have any um, input or say in this I let it all be student driven so you can kind of see um, we do a whole class and you can go to the next one we also do um, newsletters for our classroom, and this is just more traditional because when I meet with my parents at open house in the beginning of the year, I like to ask them, um, where can I meet you most online? Is it going to be through email? Would you like a service like Remind via text messaging? Or do you want that physical, tangible piece of paper like the traditional newsletter that comes home weekly or monthly? So it's really getting to know, not only do we personalize instruction for students, but we personalize communication for parents. So the more ways you teach, the more students you reach, the more different ways you communicate, the more parents you reach. So the traditional newsletter is something that our grade level pushes out. We used to do it weekly, but now we do it monthly, and it's very comprehensive. We talk about all the different content areas, what we're doing, any events we have going up in the school, any specific um, dates that the parents might need to nation just really goes in that traditional newsletter that's in print form. We also upload it to our website as well. But in addition to knowing just about school events um, and happenings within the classroom or reminders about school lunches or pictures and all of the fun stuff, parents really like to be in the loop in terms of their child's academics as well. So, so one of the services for literacy that I use in our classroom is a free service. I love sharing free products that are easy to use. Um, one of the free services that I use is called Easy CBM for Easy Curriculum Based Measurement. So I am not all about assessing children all the time, but I am about children to drive your instruction as a teacher. So one of the tools that I use, I hate that. Um, because I think if it's not used and if it's um, if it's used for the right purposes and not overdone, then it can be really beneficial. So what I like about it is there's a variety of different grade levels that you can see, and as a teacher, you can kind of select and choose do what you want based on your student population. For me, I don't do any of the pieces within the system except for the comprehension piece. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see the comprehension piece just.
is a story that the kids can really find and underline. And then some, they have to really connect their background knowledge to clues within the text to really make those rich inferences. What I do with the kids is I use these easy CBM curriculum-based measurement comprehension tools is close reading. So for example, I might take this particular passage and have the students, I'll put this under my document camera, and really take the opportunity to teach close reading strategies and kind of chunk it paragraph by paragraph and work through it and how to kind of attack this to understand it. And then whenever we get to, say, question one, and we want to go find the answer, we go back into the text and we find it. And I have the kids underline where they're doing this. Of course, they've already marked up the text a lot. They've got a minimum amount of marginal notes and side information and underlining and arrows so that whenever they go back to find answer number one, they can really quickly locate that and underline it and put a one by it with a circle around it. So that I tell them later on when I go back in the event that they missed a question, I can kind of see the footprints of their thinking as to where that misunderstanding occurred. Parents like seeing that piece as well. But what I like about it is if you go to the next slide, um, you'll start to see kind of the data piece that goes with it. And this has been really beneficial for parents, especially for schools that don't have the finances to endeavors or WEA or some sort of um, robust assessment type form. Whether you're against those or not, um, they do serve. Um, um, positives in my opinion. So one of the pieces, since we don't particularly use any system like that within our school for grade two students, I do like this data component because it kind of shows, and I don't really use it to reference national norms or any of that. I just use it to compare individual students against individual students. So their growth and progress over time as it relates to that particular student, not as a systematic um, form across the country or any sort of national norm sets. So ways that, um, that I connect, just a variety of ways now, um, that have really just been so, so great with my classroom. First one is photo circles. And this I love because it's more of a secure platform in that it's not just pushing everything out on Instagram for the world to see, even though you can do a private Instagram account, which I'm a fan of Instagram, but I actually post a lot of pictures on there and I'll, I'll share some ways that really cool schools are doing great things with Instagram. But if you do need something private um, or more private, you can use something like photo circles. What I like about it is I can invite certain people to join certain circles. And the only people who I invite are a particular circle. So for example, you can set up a 2014-2015 second grade class circle and add pictures throughout the entire year. I've got some circles with over like 1,200 pictures in it. And parents really love just having that access to that particular circle. So you can do a lot of different options with that. You can have an art class circle. You can have a second grade language arts class circle. You can even invite um, the different parents and students to collaborate and add their own pictures to those circles. And you can comment on individual pictures within those circles as well. So just a lot of really cool features with that. Twitter is a little, um, less private, a lot more open, but you can't and have private Twitter accounts as well. But schools are using this in so many creative ways. So basketball scores, you know, if dad's on the road on a business trip and he wants to see how his son's doing in basketball, he can view in real time if someone's kind of tweeting out the different plays and the events of happenings. So uh, of course schools are using it just throughout the day in the classroom, academic purposes as well. If we kind of keep going, we'll see some of that. Um, one of my favorite people who has, um, Oh, I wanted to mention to you really quick, sorry. You can, parents can join Twitter, well, and find out about what's going on with the school hashtag without even having a, I know some parents are like, well, I'm not on Twitter, I don't have an account. If you just Google a hashtag or go within Twitter in that search box, you can just put in the hashtag and view all of the content. You don't have to have a Twitter account to access any of this information. On the next slide, I think, uh, we'll skip that one. Um, oh, I must have gotten it out of order. I'll come back to it in just a minute. Um, skip this one too, actually. All right, I guess I'll come back to Twitter in a minute. Um, Pinterest for another social media platform. Um, I have a variety of different Pinterest boards set up. In fact, I have over 100 boards set up. Um, Periscope is my probably newest favorite tool that I'm using right now in terms of communicating. And this one is, I'm not sure if it's Android yet. Um, I do know 
it is iOS based. I have it on my phone. So one way that I'm using Periscope is, for example, my kids were using Kahoot the other day in the classroom with the iPads, and they were really having such a tremendous time with it. I had to share it out for anyone that A, might not be familiar with Kahoot, or B, not really know how to kind of use it in a classroom setting. So, and plus I just wanted to share how much fun my kids were having, to be quite honest. So I and what it did was it enabled me to immediately send out a tweet that said, hey, we're periscoping and you can click here and join. But as people would kind of come in, I could see in real time in the bottom of my phone all the viewers that would immediately pop up. And seriously, in about 30 seconds, I had over 80 people watching my kids do Kahoot. And of course, you can be more private about it and only show like the device and the children's arms and not really share their faces um, and just share more of the smart board and the internet action that's going on without having to kind of cross any privacy um, barriers there um, or if your school doesn't have any issues with that of course then you can share the entire landscape of the classroom in spaces um, but it's really tremendous too to even get comments in real time uh, one of them was like oh my gosh look how fun that you, you could see the excitement and it was so cute because one of my kids had just done something great in terms of answering question and they literally jumped out of their seat and they're like yes and they're so excited and someone commented on that and you can click the screen on Periscope if you're a viewer or watch and instantly it'll give it a heart like a like and so it's really kind of um, interesting too for the kids to kind of see because you can play it back later and watch it so my kids like doing that and we never Periscope longer than like two minutes or so so they're really just short videos um, today I was able to bring a keynote um, and where was he um, I don't know, somewhere and doing a keynote for one of the future ready summits and I was able to watch him for just a second in St. Louis um, though I was just, just on my plan period in the classroom so just being able to be inside somewhere in real time and seeing something that's going on is is pretty cool rather than having to wait for it to upload and share it out later so it, it's really um, a fun interactive way to communicate so hopefully you got some interesting ways to communicate um, within the classroom with your instructional delivery and how you kind of give that out to students. And then, of course, with your students, also the classroom.